On July 4, 1950, a business entrepreneur named Willard F. Tunney opened the gates to a new and refined horse racing track in Littleton, Colorado. Despite stormy weather and speculations of failure, over 13,000 people passed through the gates that day, wagering nearly half a million dollars. Sitting in the stands among the rain-soaked crowd were sports writers Leonard Kahn and George Franco. Over the next 30 years, their writing would help shape the fame and popularity of the contenders involved with the track. From the jockeys to the trainers, from the owners to the betters. The very people who gave Centennial Racetrack its charm and charisma. The passion for horse racing. And the very element that tied the fans, jockeys, owners, and trainers together. A passion shared by the community of Littleton, Colorado, that would make Centennial Racetrack one of the greatest horse racing tracks of its time. On May 27, 1949, the newspapers spilled some good news for Littleton. Construction on the new racetrack was finally scheduled to begin. The area would run parallel with the Platte River from Bellevue Avenue to Bowles Avenue. Local dignitaries such as Richard H. Heckendorf, Nate Burt, and Richard H. Simon couldn't have been more excited. After several years of uncertainty, their efforts to build the track had finally paid off. But it certainly didn't happen overnight. Well, let's start back in 1948 uh, when the legislature passed the paramutual law to where they could have a racetrack. Uh, and in, that was in 48. And in 49, they ran thoroughbred paramutual racing at Brush, Colorado. I remember it from 1948 actually when the land was first purchased and they had several names for it we finally wound up as Centennial Racetrack. Before that of course Littleton was a was a thriving county seat farm center place you know the uh, the international harvester dealer and all of those <coughs> things for Rappo County were here. Littleton is pretty much a typical western town with a population a little over 3,000. Life here is quieter and simpler than in the rush of the big cities. The advent of the track in 1950 changed things. People would come in from, uh, from Utah and from Oklahoma and Kansas and Nebraska and New Mexico to race their horses here, and they still flock in from those areas because Centennial was the track of the region at its time. It was the biggest thing happening around for, for many states around. And, and it, it bring up the big races, the big money, the competition. And so you had hotels that were booked constantly. You had restaurants of, of of the finest class, the amount of people that came into the area, the development of homes around the area, it was a magnet for development and community activity. Everything was close. Your bars were close, the restaurants were all close. It was right near, like I say, Abe's restaurant. Was, I mean, you couldn't get in that place. Well, I believe Little, Littleton benefited in many ways economically. Um, restaurants, motels, certainly the, the feed stores. In the Littleton area, they had major businessmen and players that uh, were very supportive of it. Also, I have to say that, you know, this, a track of this magnitude at that time, uh, it was really the major game in town, that be it for the sports dollar. It was not like a little hometown type racetrack that was big and uh, people 
would come from all over the country to race at Centennial. There were people who came to the racetrack from, from all over, I mean all walks of life and from various parts of the state. It had a following. The track attracted a wide variety of horse racing fans. Some were there to relax and socialize, see the horses, and enjoy the breeze. Others, however, had only one thing in mind, to see their horses win. After all, this was horse racing. Well, the people that uh, came to the track to gamble, too, were a different kind of people. Uh, they would get involved right in it, just like the horsemen would. They were people that loved horses and loved money, too, but they were gamblers, and they gambled a lot, but they were still people that you would like to be around, and they, they were your friends. Crowds were something. You couldn't, you'd be shoulder to shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder. You just, uh, you couldn't move. Could not move. And it was, uh, it was exciting. We'd pull in in our 55 Chevy and we'd go up into the grandstands and I can remember the, distinctively the smell of the cigar smoke was so distinctive to the area because we were never around any other cigar smoke anywhere else. And, and uh, you'd go past the shoe signers on the way in and the shoe signers, these guys were tops. They knew what they were doing. I, and uh, the guys would be standing around discussing the form and getting their shoes polished. And onward we go into the opening which faced to the east. And I remember that uh, it was just perfect lighting because the sun was always at our back. Uh, to the west, typically about the time post time would strike or it would be dead overhead. And uh, that made for perfect conditions for racing. The lighting was good, the colors were brilliant. It was just exciting right up to the post time. And Centennial got great crowds. Uh, they had an incredible staff drawn primarily from uh, veteran racing officials in California. Ivan Thomas was the general manager, a, a remarkable man. One of the first micromanagers I ever uh, ran into, but he, the, the racetrack was just his home and everybody there was his guest. And it was important for him to know which flowers were being watered and which horses were doing what on the, I mean, he was totally in charge of everything that happened on the racetrack. You know, he would go around the shed roads every day if somebody had problems. Instead, of the, he was just the greatest it could be. I think he probably was one of the elite general managers of all racetracks. And he had done his uh, introductory racetrack management work with a man by the name of Bill Veck that owned Bay Meadows Racetrack in California. And uh, he brought along with him some very quality uh, officiating people that just made it a state-of-the-art place and not only that the plant in itself the location of the stable area was very useful for the horseman to train because as a horseman the distance between your barn and your racetrack means how long it takes to train a racehorse or something and I believe and I have been to Belmont I have been to Aqueduct and I have been to the tracks in California and all over and I have not seen the track that was as well situated, horseman friendly, as the backside of Centennial was. The best I liked about Centennial was the, the amount of horses I could get on. Cause the stable area, was, it, was, it was built just right. The stable area was right next to the track, and it didn't take you long. You know, it just didn't take long to gallop a horse. To me, it was a great honor when I was a kid to get to ride at Centennial and I, I was just four foot four and weighed 59 pounds soaking wet. And uh, I got there, and of course there was, uh, like back then there was a hundred and some riders at the track. There wasn't one or two, there was lots of riders. And the quality of the racetrack and stuff, like you're asking, was, was so great. It was just like riding at Santa Anita or Hot Springs or Lexington, Kentucky. The racetrack surface, one of the best racetrack surfaces in the United States that I ever run on and I've run a lot of places since then. Ivan Thomas and the staff at Centennial Racetrack maintained a high quality racing atmosphere. But it was the horses and horse people that raced at Centennial. As a rule, 
Horse people rise before the sun. First light, why uh, the barns are, are moving, the grooms, or guineas as we used to call them in those days, the grooms are feeding the horses, grooming the horses, cleaning the stalls. Uh, and as soon as, uh, as soon as you can get a cup of coffee at first light, why then you're over to the barn as an exercise boy. A typical day was getting there at 5.30 in the morning, you know, just get there and start galloping. I mean, they had them tacked up, the guys were tacked up and they were shouting. I mean, they shouted from 5.30 to 10 o'clock. And they'd bomb me out, where are you, where are you? Tacked up, they'd have two, maybe three horses tacked up. And, I, and they'd just keep me running. And, then you, nev and you never knew what you was going to get on. Because your adrenaline was going, somebody say, and some of them horses weren't even broke. People that ride horses, especially these jockeys, I think they're some of the fittest people you'll ever meet. They're very strong, they're very lean, and they're dynamite for their size. And the jockeys, of course, uh, all have agents, and the agents are going from barn to barn with the overnight uh, things to arrange uh, rides for their, for their jocks uh, the day or the day after. Now, one of the problems you have getting the jockey as an owner, trainer, etc., is sometimes... Uh, a trainer may have 30 or 40 horses there, and this jockey gets the first call, okay? Uh, and so you have a tough time getting a jockey. You try to get a jockey who knows your horse. You hope you can get a jockey who obviously will work your horse in the morning, get to know, and they get to the track awfully early. And these guys were up at 4 o'clock. They were down at the track. They were down there talking to the grooms, talking to the trainers, talking to the owners, galloping the horses, feeling them out for the race, making decisions on how the horse would make its move in the races. These were, it was a big, it's a, it's a big cultural entity of its own. Prior to the race, they bring the horses to the paddock. And when they come in the paddock, the paddock judge checks the horse's tattoo to make sure it's the right horse, etc. The trainer, they saddle them up and cinch them up. And then the jocks will come out and they'll come to the prospective paddock place. Then they call riders up and they get boosted up on the horse. And uh, they, they're led out to the track, typically by what we call a pony horse. And they led out in number, so uh, number one will go out first, etc. And that, then they go out and they warm up. Uh, and they're, they're out there probably for, I don't know, seven, eight minutes, something like that, before they actually go into the gate. And then when they're in the gate, you have the assistant starters trying to calm the horses, make sure everybody, so we, there's a good, clean break. And then uh, they probably say the sign of the cross, and away they go. <laughs> and they're off! Out of the gate on the inside, Lynn Darlene sets the early speed. On the outside, there's Indian Moon with Terry. In the mid-1960s, just as Centennial Racetrack was gaining nationwide popularity and attendance was reaching new heights, the track faced a major disaster. On the morning of June 16, 1965, the rain began. It was a downspout rain up on uh, East and West Plum Creek, and a huge amount of water fell in a very short time and created in those drainages really a tidal wave. Uh, the river didn't rise, the river just flushed right down. And uh, it, was, uh, it was unbelievably devastating. Oh, the flood was terrible. I seen a wall of water come through there and we had, uh, in fact, we was on the racetrack with horses and we, we left riding and went up to the higher hills and I spent four days in a two-car garage with a horse that I rode in and raced because of the flood. We couldn't get back. We had to get out of there. We were advised, all the horsemen were advised to get their horses out of the stable area because the, the crest was rising and it was predicted to, um, to be quite devastating. So um, we had an opportunity to take our horses to a, a stable in Cherry Hills a woman that we didn't know volunteered her little stable to us. So we got our trailer and hauled our horses up there. They were, the two fillies were in the same stall, but it was a big stall. So it worked out fine. And people were just very generous in, in providing space. People had to get their horses out by that evening. And some people couldn't, some others couldn't. And because they were from out of town and away from the state, so they moved their horses to the barns, areas of the barn, <coughs> excuse me, and a uh, hundred of them drowned. I think 
the people went into panic. That's what I think. They could have saved some more horses if they knew what they were doing. But there were too many horses killed. I know that people took horses, uh, like riding them and leading them, and took them off of the racetrack up into Bomar uh, to the west and spent the night on a hill waiting for it to recede. Some of them did, did take horses from the racetrack over underneath the grandstand and they did survive, but the water even got up to the horse's uh, shoulders or withers and they were just short of uh, floating and swimming. There was five horses up in the top of the grandstand. We're talking a grandstand four stories high. These horses got up in there and, and they, thank God they were alive. Uh, it, it was something that you wouldn't believe, a wall of water coming down through there. We weren't able to get in there for two or three days. And what had happened is that as that flood came through, it, it undercut the, the, the posts that supported the shed rows and the shed row roof fell down and trapped horses in one or two feet of muck and mud, and they couldn't even move. And those horses stood there patiently, and we were able to get in and get them out, you know, a day or two later. But they had nothing but flood water to drink, and then it receded, and they were just in mud. When the flood hit, Ivan Thomas, he done a miracle job. They said we were done with racing. He went to work, rebuilt that track, we rebuilt all the damage that was done, and only lost 20 days of the meat that year. And we went on from there. Those things all point up to what a, what a great area and a place to race it was. As the track rebounded from the flood, it carried with it a fresh new energy. The reconstruction effort was so effective, Centennial once again felt like a brand new racetrack. And as the Littleton area continued to grow, so did the number of fans. And with more fans comes more money. And with more money comes bigger races. And one of uh, the status symbols in horse racing is they have different classifications. And the top classifications is to have a graded stakes race. And they have grade one, grade two, and grade three based on the some of it is the amount of the purse, some of it is the quality of the horses that you attract to the race. And these, uh, this criteria changes from time to time, and I can't really get into that, but they did with the Gold Rush Futurity. They were able to get, I believe they guaranteed $100,000 on it, and they were able to get a graded status on it. Well, the Gold Rush was certainly the big the big purse, the big money that drew horsemen and horses from all over. And it had a lot of press and um, a lot of excitement build up. That was kind of the finale that closed the racing year at Centennial. Um, there were some fine horses that came off this track that went on to bigger and better races. And a lot of them came out of races like the Gold Rush. But we simulcast into Centennial the first Kentucky Derby race that was ever shown and bet on outside of Kentucky. And we would have had it a year earlier, but Kentucky had to get their proper legislation through so they would have it. So we got it, we were the first one, and then we also did another Triple Crown race. Then other tracks followed suit, and it's involved in today to what we call the simulcasting, which they do full programs and generates millions of dollars. Our biggest handle was $906,000, if I recall, and that's when we ran the Kentucky Derby to add satellite racing, which was great for the handle of the track, but when that started, it, where you could go race, bet in racing facilities other than the track, the handle went up, but the attendance went down. Even just uh, having the one racetrack of major consequence in Colorado, there was a lot of innovative things that w came out of Colorado that's beneficial and is carried on today in horse racing. For many people, the memories from Centennial are still clear, both sweet and bittersweet. 
But my biggest memory of racetrack is when I was informed that one of my deposits was missing ten thousand dollars because every day I had a figure fifteen percent of the handle went to the to the bank. I had a three hundred thousand dollar bankroll and I was responsible for all the money. And if we ran a three or four day weekend racing, we're handling a million dollars, you know. And I was informed by the Bank of Englewood that one of my deposits was short, $10,000. Most of that was in cash and checks. The balance was in checks. I make up the deposits every day. My assistant, he checks it. So they required security, wanted everybody to take lie detector tests that was involved with the money. Myself, my assistant, employees of uh, Englewood Bank. The way it was caught is funny. We deposited the money in just a cloth money bag, large ones. And I had, we used lead seals. We crimped it. My tag had CTC crimped on it, Centennial Turf Club. Well, the bank didn't have the money. I didn't have the money. I balanced every night. I was over short. I mean, that kind of money, we went through the figures. Come to find out that an employee by the name of Brown, a new employee, was sitting in the back of the armored motors truck. He'd cut the seal, reached in, took $10,000 in $50 bills, and resealed the bag with a plain tag. Didn't have CTC on it. So he questioned people at the track with the money room down there, and he admitted he'd taken it, had paid some bills with it and giving a lot of the money away. So I was summoned a, by the Rappo County. He was tried and convicted of theft of $10,000. And I still have nightmares over that. I mean, I knew I didn't have it. And I had, at the time, I had 19 people working in that money room on busy days, on weekends. And this was a Sunday night deposit, so it was quite a relief. Turned my hair white, actually. <laughs> I was a dentist for 19 years in Aurora, and I took some alfalfa out one morning, six bales to unload a horse barn before daylight, and then I'd take care of a couple of horses and go to my practice. And uh, I heard, a, like you sensed something behind you, the shed roll was dark, and I knew something was behind me, and uh, I turned around, it was Freckles. It's the name of the horse. His nickname was Freckles. But anyway, I turned around and I said, I pointed my finger. I said, Freckles, you son of a bitch, get away from me. And he reared, and when he come down, he had to hold my finger. Uh, he threw me from side to side, and then he was as frightened as I was. I guess I was yelling, carrying on. Our hay sheds come down with a four by four into a cement block, and he threw me when the, he was throwing me back and forth in my right knee that the bolt come through that block the bolt kept going hitting my knee so when he finally left loose and I want to tell you about letting loose in a little bit but when he let loose I crawled around in front of my pickup because the, the lights were on it was that dark and I didn't know my finger was gone my knee was hurting so bad and I 
put my hand down on my knee like this and I looked down and there was no finger. There have been many people and horses that got their springboard start at Centennial Racetrack. And two of the horses that I can, uh, well, three that I can recall, in 1950 they had a horse came and raced at Centennial the opening year as a two-year-old who went on to race in the Kentucky Derby the following year. And uh, his name was Phil D. He was a great horse and a great stallion and a good running horse. Probably one of the best horses that run at Centennial was Phil D, and, that, and I was not. He ran fourth in the Kentucky Derby and won several stake races at Centennial. He, uh, you can go down the line. Spicy, we have a race still named after her. My father raced a mare by the name of Spicy, uh, who won 31 races over a racing career. Uh, she set three tr track records at three different distances at Centennial. And in racing, you have your, you have your classifications of the boys and the girls. And if the, the mares or fillies, whatever you call them, race against the boys and you beat them, you have, you know, it's an exceptional deal. And Spicy did this. She won. Uh, the Rocky Mountain Handicap two years in a row, racing against the boys. My horse's favorite horses, Indian Serenade. That was a, one of my favorite horses, would always come from off the pace and would uh, come around that turn and I'd always remember the announcer saying, and then comes Indian Serenade. And that was, that was a, a horse that stuck in my mind for a long time. Great horses and, and, and hard fought races. Uh, uh, the Tux had the, the solid Sada horse, and uh, John Norton had a, a, a good horse. Uh, there was Roman history was a great horse that Glenn Bamford changed, trained, and Spicy, of course, was a great horse. Centennial would race probably the best horses in the world. And they're off. Chrismo broke on top on the outside with extreme early speed. And, and some of the people associated uh, on with the racing today got their beginnings at Centennial Racetrack. And to name a few, D. Wayne Lucas is one of them. He was a, uh, he was a school teacher turned horse trainer, out of, came out of South Dakota, and he raced at Centennial. And I believe, uh, I don't know the exact number, but I think he's won at least 12 Triple Crown races and been leading trainer in the nation several years. Uh, another one uh, that's currently very popular is Bob Baffert, who's been winning Triple Crown races. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the trainers, uh, Kevin Eichelberry, he probably had one of the most famous horses out there, Bronco Mania, and it was in the Bronco days, so it was really interesting when he had this hot horse out there winning the Gold Rush Stakes. The May Valley Farms, Harvey May, I would say he trained for me, and I'm a little biased, but he was one of the greatest trainers. He could, he trained all over the country. He had some offers to go big time, and he stayed at Centennial and then followed the circuit at other places. I would consider him one of the best, best trainers around. Centennial was like the kindergarten class for them, and they went on to, um, to um, be very successful and I could name many of them. Many of them came from eastern Colorado around Springfield, Lamar, Hawley, and across the border into Kansas. And um, when you get right down to it and think about it, even today, many of these su successful trainers had some roots in Colorado racing. We had a, a good colony of lady, women, jockeys at Centennial and it has disappeared out here. There's good jockeys all over the United States, great jockeys. Shelley Rutherford, she rode so many races for me and win a lot for me. Uh, Shelley Rutherford was one of my favorite. Um, she, she could ride a horse um, 
whether it was a long distance, three, uh, like a mile, a mile sixteenth, or it was um, six furlongs or five furlongs. Um, uh, Shelly was great. We used Shelly quite a bit. Uh, a, a great one that used to be here was Tommy Swan, uh, T-O-M-E-Y. And believe it or not, she's still riding in New Mexico. Her husband, Pat, is a, a, a trainer. And she was a quarter horse jock, Tommy. And um, so she was, she was another um, good female jock. They were the two top female jockeys, I recall. Jockeys, there's always the trouble when they go on the gate. It's a it's a very, not only in the gate, exercising and so forth. Michelle Higley, a lady jockey, she got hurt in a morning accident and passed away from it. And we had a memorial race for her. Uh, in, the, in the gates, there's many times that the, the horses uh, will rear or flip and uh, jockeys get hurt. I was a Dennis, as I say, and I treated uh, many times jockeys that got their teeth knocked out. And as far as the jockeys are concerned, there's just more than you can mention, but there were very well-renowned known jockeys, Eddie R. Carroll, Longdon. Uh, I believe Shoemaker did make it. I don't recall for sure, but the one that I do remember was a man by the name of Keith Asmussen. The Eclipse Award winning jockey Jerry Bailey, the hot rider in America who has been for the last four or five years. Every horseman in America wants Jerry Bailey. They, they really vie for his services. Jerry rode here at Centennial. But Del Jessup, uh, a great jockey, and he was in his 50s, 60s when he was still riding here. Arthur Anderson, uh, had raced all the big tracks and, and came and raced here. The favorite jockeys at that time were uh, Bradley Rollins, uh, Dick Powell. Uh, Centennial was exciting for me for a lot of reasons because when I was a kid, they said, oh, you ain't never going to be nothing. You ain't going to get nothing done. you you got to have some pull this and that. Well, I got in there, and I, next thing I know, I'm riding horses like for Glenn Bamford and them, and the, getting on horses like Spicy, and having a runaway, and it, it, it made my day. Many jockeys who learned the ropes at Centennial went on to bigger and greater races. However, many of the jockeys remained in Littleton, finding the climate perfect for training and racing. Some of these jockeys became masters of their craft, attracting many fans. Some of these jockeys became legends. One such jockey was a man by the name of Jack Keane. Jack Keane rode it to smaller tracks in Illinois, and he came to Colorado. And uh, I was intending CSU, and so was he. Jack Keane. Uh, left the possibility of a career as a veterinarian up at CSU. He was in the veterinary school and uh, rightly or wrongly uh, decided to become a jockey. Certainly he made a lot more money doing that, but uh, the overhead uh, of being a writer is considerably more than being a practitioner. But he was one of the best riders, all-around riders on a horse, a young horse, an older horse, uh, uh, a horse that uh, wanted to unload you, I mean, uh, a racing saddle is a little bit like a postage stamp, and, but once Jack Keane was put on a horse, he stayed on that horse, and uh, it was like he had grown there. It seemed like he always liked to lay way back in the pack, and then they'd say, here comes Jack Keane with a rush on whatever horse he was on. Jack was probably the ice man of them all. When you thought you had him beat, you was wrong. He'd beat you. Uh, he could bring a horse so far off of it that it was unreal. He never got excited. He cared less. Uh, uh, you never heard him brag about winning a race or a damn thing. He, he wouldn't do that. We wasn't scared of riding on any kind of a racetrack because Jack had the philosophy of that uh, a horse didn't want to fall any worse than you did, let him run. He wasn't born with a bridle in his mouth. 
So why take a hold of him? Uh, he had all kinds of little things like that that people would just scare you to death about watching Jack ride because he'd throw the reins and just turn their head loose and horse would just run around there. And I learned that from him. So I picked it up and everybody used to say, well, you ride a whole lot like Jack. Well, Jack taught me. He's the cigar man. He always walked around with a cigar and they weren't just ordinary ones. Mr. Cigar. He, his, his cigar was farther out here than he was tall. <laughs> it was really neat. He smoked cigars that was a foot and a half long by about an inch in diameter. He liable to have it in the starting gate. And he was liable to have an ice cream bar eating it in the starting gate. I mean, he was a little different. Yes, he broke his leg one time and he was in a, a full leg cast. Well, of course, he can't ride. And that went on for about a couple of weeks, and he just took a chisel and a hammer and took the cast off and went back riding again. You know, the guy was incredible. Jack Keene had more dental work than probably all of us put together, but he come to me and uh, he had a lower bridge, he had a lower tooth that he thought needed a root canal, and uh, then he had a bridge up here and they had put white facings on the front of a bridge, and uh, he had me check that and do all of his work. But I checked that, I said, boy, they missed the shade on this bridge. It was yellow, that facing. I said, that's a terrible color. They should have, he said, oh, that facing fell out. He took a piece of his whip and carved out one and glued it on there. Then I get down to the tooth that had the root canal. And it was a, it had a plastic little crown on and a pin down in the hole you, the root canal, you drill the n nerve out and take it out and leave a hole. And if the tooth is broke off, you build it and put a crown on. And I started messing and I took a, I said, what in the hell with that? He went to the hardware store, got him a little tiny screw. The tooth had went dead, put a screw and built his own tooth. So I took that out and I'd done a root canal. And, while, and finally I reached over and I got a hand mirror and I said, now you hold this up here, and if you see me do anything wrong, Jack, just stop me so I can go ahead and finish your dental work. Years ago, I, was, I thought I'd start riding, you know. I'd start losing weight, and Jack Keen, he let me borrow all his riding gear, you know. I'm about to ride the quarter horses because I'm too heavy to ride thoroughbreds. And I was too heavy to ride quarter horses. I couldn't, I mean, I was killing myself, and I was making a good living galloping, but I couldn't do it. And Jack said, well, come into the, come into the sweat room, you know, and I, so went in the sweat room with him and to the box, you know, and I looked at him and I thought, man, there's no, there's no way, that I can't look like that. I mean, he looked like a dried up old lizard, you know, Jack did. Then he got to jumping off horses in the winter circle off a horse that he jumped way in the air and land on the ground outside of him. So they got to calling him jumping off Jack. When he dismounted, he just jumped straight up by the stirrups onto the ground. Most horse jockeys would just climb off the horse. He'd leap. It just as, you know, far in the air. Every time I'd see it, I was waiting for him to fall, but he never did. <laughs> he never did. Jumping Jack, that's right. And he never pulled a race in his life. He, he was honest, and uh, you could uh, count on him. He was a man with a tremendous brain and a lot of athletic ability. Jack Keane was a classic. You know, Lost a great man in him. I see stars. Covered one and one sixteenth miles in a minute, 45 seconds. The master jockey, Jack Keane, was in the saddle. In 1981, just as the track collected nearly $1 million of wagers in a single day, the announcement was made that the track was to be sold to the Tally Corporation and Denver developer Kenneth Good for $17.7 million, over 100 times the original $160,000 purchase of the land in 1949. You know, as far as the sale and the closing of the racetrack, it happened so quickly and it's still very, it's still a very puzzling situation. The, uh... Horsemen, we could not quite understand or grasp the idea of selling the track at Centennial because it had just set a record year. 
in 1981, and then we heard that it was sold. I think the writing was on the wall that horse racing was diminishing uh, the, the, the numbers. It was a numbers game. Then they shortened us down on racing, and not enough horses were coming in anymore. You know, the better horses. It was a situation where it was almost inevitable. Centennial was no longer a, a hometown run operation. Uh, Delaware North uh, and, and essentially absentee owners who had, to be sure, economies of scale, you know, and they were vertically integrated. They, they had the concessions, they had a whole lot of things, and they ended up buying racetracks because concessionaires make money at the racetrack. Uh, and eventually they are in a cash position if a track gets into trouble to, to step in and own the equity. And I think that happened at Centennial. Delaware North from Buffalo I think was more or less a tax write-off. Property was very valuable out there. And uh, now they've got condominiums and River Point and golf course and everything on it. I think it was a matter of money, actually. Finally, on November 6th, 1983, as light flurries dropped upon a nostalgic crowd of horse racing fans, the last of over 23,000 races was run. A year later, the track was leveled. I think at the time it closed, it kind of hurt the city a little, to like places like Valley Feed Store, Essex Motel, because it brought a lot of people from out of Littleton, out of state actually, to see the horses run. Several businesses that uh, were not able to stay open because of the loss of business that Centennial Racetrack created. Well, economy-wise, I just don't see how it, you know, could, could be anything good that came out of it turned down. I know that the revenue had to have been great. I know that the few times I got to go up in the money room at the end of the day and see $500,000 stacked on the wall, there's like, whoa, you know. You know, a lot of that money is coming back into the economy. I do know that I talked to some restaurants and they really lost a lot of business after they cl their track closed. Motels were torn down. And it just was not the same. Today, condominiums and businesses fill the area where the grandstand once stood. A golf course stretches along the Platte River, using much of the same space that was the track and infield. For most people, the new area is just another new development. But for others, it's a place that holds many memories. It is the place that was once Centennial Racetrack. Every day was a memorable moment. I mean, I, uh, it was enjoyable, and the camaraderie, and the people. Well, when you see the same people every day, seven days a week, you become quite close. I, uh, I miss all the old people that was at the track. There were so many good people, nice people, families. It was such a family place. My grandfather, my grandmother, my aunts, my uncles, my brothers. It was nice to be around. I mean, the folks were nice. The town was nice. They were treated and nice. And um, characters. Characters ain't there anymore. No all kinds of characters. I was 30 when I started the track, you know. And I put in 50, 34 years out there. And I think, you know, I think about it when the track was finally leveled and he built the uh, river point and all I had to walk over there and I still have memories of it. it was my life, you know, that, that long. As I have dreams at night now, something's getting kind of wrong with me. I dream nearly every night, but uh, the dreams are always horses.